enough to stop stop you at 15 minutes. We are good to go. Um, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome uh, to this uh, uh, very, very important event uh, co-organized by the Global Policy Institute and, uh, and Bay Atlantic University in Washington, DC. My name is Paolo von Schirach. I am the president of the Global Policy Institute and chair of political science and international relations at Bay Atlantic University. It is my really uh, distinct uh, pleasure to welcome uh, this uh, exceptional panel of experts on uh, a very new, well, relatively new, I guess, aspect of the whole uh, continuum of uh, agriculture uh, in Africa and, of course, uh, globally. Uh, you know, agriculture is, is a basic stuff, it's food, it's survival for most of us. <laughs> Um, uh, whether we are in the United States or, or in the African continent, or in Asia or elsewhere. And, and so today we will get insights on how digital technologies and other IT sophisticated tools can enable new ways of looking at agriculture, planning, you know, execution, whatever. I, but I'll leave it to the experts to discuss it. Um, we are, as I said, this is a, the latest, but certainly not the last, event that we are co-hosting at GPI and BAU on, on uh, African agriculture. And this is, and we're especially thankful to the organizer, to Adam Saffer, our board member, who has uh, really uh, lent his own significant knowledge and expertise and networks um, in Africa uh, and beyond to prepare uh, and, and give us uh, uh, really the opportunity here in Washington, DC to listen and to learn from experts from the continent. And today we're looking forward to this latest uh, installment. Without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to, to Adam, uh, who it will be um, moderating the event, introduce the speakers and, and, uh, and run this uh, session. Adam, over to you. Thank you, Paulo. It's a pleasure to be back and welcome to all of you who are listening via, via Zoom or Facebook. Um, welcome to the fourth webinar in a series focused on sustainable agriculture in Africa. Today's one hour program comprises presentations from three highly qualified agricultural practitioners who are creating and deploying digital technologies as a key ingredient in their business strategies. And personally, after living in Africa for most of the last 30 years, I can assure you that agricultural development, both for food security as well as poverty relief is the, has the greatest potential really to, to improve rural livelihoods, foster stability, and productively engage women and youth. Before hearing from the speakers, I'd like to take a minute to define what we mean by agricultural digitization. It's a mouthful. Um, so simply, it is the use of digital technologies to integrate agricultural production across the entire value chain, from the farm to the, or paddock to the consumer. Digitization has already proven that it can efficiently and effectively unlock the potential of smallholder farmers and more generally the agribusiness sector. These technologies provide agribusinesses with tools, data, and information to make more informed decisions. Innovations in digital agriculture help farmers increase their yields and incomes by sourcing inputs such as seeds, fertilizers, and other crop protection products. And through various types of platforms, it can also help identify off-takers, sources of finance, new markets, and technical assistance. For example, contactless payments through FinTech, uh, um, remote sensing through drones, freely available and really decent quality satellite imagery for monitoring fields, digital marketplaces where producers and off-takers can meet and trade, and data analytics to better manage the business as well as prepare for changing market and climactic conditions. So I hope that adequately sets the stage of what we're talking about today. So now let's listen to the folks who live and breathe these issues every day. The format of today's webinar will be to hear from our three speakers followed by a Q&A session. So please feel free to type your questions as some of you have already done in the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. So today we're gonna to start with Kiprop Churcher, 
the founder and CEO of Mamlaka Foods in Kenya. Kip is a blockchain crusader who is currently building Africa's largest blockchain platform to broaden the transactional use for smallholder farmers. Welcome, Kip. Thank you very much for having me. You're welcome. I'd like to start going from the broad to the specific by asking you to give us your view on the overall state of digitization in agriculture in Africa, not specifically where you work, but overall continental wide. You know, what are the key changes or interventions required to facilitate this transformation? So over the last decade, we have witnessed a deepening in the mobile penetration, which has been a key enabler of all the other infrastructural support. We have watched uh, the growth of mobile payments, like in Kenya, you have uh, M-Pesa that started from Kenya and many other mobile networks have it. We are, <clears throat> we are witnessing a lot of digital literacy because of the penetration of the smartphones. And these are tools that have been able to enable uh, a lot of um, digitization process in agriculture. However, on the flip side, we are also witnessing a lot of disjointed, uh, expensive, and at times hard to use solutions, which make it very difficult for the farmer. The farmer being the last mile in this process uh, is the one that if we uh, manage to digitize a lot of things around the farmer, then we would be ready to go. Thank you, thank you. I know it's a tough question, it's a big question. So let's get that a little more specifically to Mamlaka. What aspects of digitization are you focusing on? So at Mamlaka, we are in a mission to build a marketplace that connects farmers to buyers and uh, integrate using blockchain and artificial intelligence. We have built a solution that creates a transparent, uh, removing many players in the field. One of the biggest challenges you find in many African countries is the number of intermediaries who are involved in all this. Um, for example, most average value chains in Kenya uh, deal with a minimum of seven to 14 intermediaries. And many of them don't add value, but they just double up and uh, replicate costs. So in order to do that, We've tried for the last two years to build different solutions. And uh, when we finally uh, integrated blockchain into this, we were able to build all-in-one uh, ledger that enables everybody to borrow and uh, pick uh, information from there. This solution, which links farmers, also has enabled us to uh, ride on um, what we call smart uh, warehouses. We have small collection centers which are closer to the farmers and we have used those ones as collection centers. At the market level, we are building uh, micro fulfillment centers or dark warehouses, which enables us to serve the customer faster and also enables us to collaborate with other e-commerce platforms to fulfill their orders. Very good. Yeah, the, the, the number of agents and middle people uh, along that value chain, one, you know, separates the actual buyer from the producer and uh, takes advantage oftentimes of the, the, the chain before that person, typically the farmer. It's, it's odd how at each end of the, at each end of the value chain, the farmer and the consumer, I think you were telling me this, Kip, one day, you know, they're the ones that get taken advantage of the most. It's interesting so you say that because the two most important people in this value chain is the producer and the, and the consumer. And the producer earns very little and the consumer pays very expensive. And all the men and women in the middle make all the money and to the detriment of the two important players. Exactly, exactly. So with, with your blockchain and uh, in warehouse and systems, you know, looking, looking beyond Mamlaka, you know, um, how can you, these solutions, how do you think these solutions will affect the sector in the industry? In other words, how can your innovations and advancements be scaled? Or do you expect them to be scaled? Do you expect them to be picked up or are you thinking broader than Kenya? What's, what's, the, what's the replication factor here? One of the things that you realize is uh, many African countries, uh, depending on uh, 
where they were colonized from, they have almost the same structures, whether agricultural infrastructure, whether uh, mobile network operators. So one of the, Mamlaka is built as a collaborative platform because one of the biggest challenges we have in the market is we have many people building the same solutions and nobody's learning from the other. We're very excited about our blockchain solution as it gives many, par many partners like financial institutions. We are going to have input distributors. We will uh, have uh, quality, uh, quality checks traceability, and we'd be able to plug, if we went to Uganda, we went to another country, we'd be able to plug into the existing organizations as opposed to go, us going to start from, from the ground. Mm -hmm. And so we, we, we see this, if we build the platform and build, uh, and build the micro warehouses to, enable, to shorten the time of, uh, from the farmer to the customer, it then enables many other people to collaborate and build into that. And well, so that is what we're gonna pass. Well, I hope that happens. I think, I think you know, I agree with you. I'm involved with a number of countries across the continent in agriculture and, and a number of people watching this video right now are, are doing similar things. And I just hope that everybody has the, has the gumption to reach out to each other and talk. There's plenty of room for many actors this is not a, 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 a zero sum game by any means. But let, let me drill down just a second, Kip, in what you were saying. Who, who specifically, I mean, I'm not looking at pointing my finger to blame anyone, but who specifically are the key drivers, the enablers, the accelerators in Africa? Because these are the groups we need to support. You know, we're trying to transform into a more efficient and effective and digitized uh, agricultural sector, but Really, who, other than the thousands of entrepreneurs like yourself who are building things, who, who else are the key drivers? Is it government? Is it the buyers? Is it the aggregators? Who are the key people to make, who are gonna end up making this happen, do you think? So the biggest transformational, uh, the biggest transformational organization in WIPI Kenya has been Safaricom, the mobile network operator. Mm -hmm. Because through the mobile network operator, we've had uh, financial services, we've had M-Pesa, which, which has really been a key driver in building the digital economy because you are able to uh, transfer money at the same level you're transferring transactions. Governments, governments, we are fortunate in Kenya to have uh, by and large, a government that has understood the speed of transformation, and we put in fiber, uh, fiber uh, coverage in Kenya, digital literacy is improving. And then we have uh, other organizations like financial institutions who must uh, tailor, build while we are innovating and building solutions, the financial institutions. And finally, legacy, Legacy, legacy infrastructure institutions. We have Kenya Farmers Association, which is over 100 years, with a lot of warehouses in this country, most of them uh, doing so badly. We have National Cereals Board. And if you go to Tanzania, you have a replica of what's happening in Kenya, and so in many countries. Uh, I read this about Ghana again, about the cooperative societies. Now, if you, if you were to bring those and the cooperative societies that were built way back in the 60s, but collapsed somewhere in the middle, this would be huge drivers and Africa can pick a big leap upwards. That's a, that's, that's a, you've identified you know, a, a number of people. I, I agree with you fully. I think some of these associations, Tanzania Tea Association with 18,000 members, or the Nigerian uh, Rice Rifan, the Rice Association of Nigeria, supposedly you know millions of members, they could be a lot stronger. They could work a lot better. And I think the building block of all of this is communication, which and integrity, which builds trust. But I'll ask the other speakers as well these questions, because I think it's really important to identify, you know, not only the problems, we're not here just to talk about the problems, we're here to talk about the solutions and how to move the ball downfield. So, so like in, in, in summary, Kip, what, what, what should and can be done over the next 12 months? You know, I'm in a lot of meetings where 
we talk about the future and it's, it's very easy to talk about in five years what we're gonna do because there's no accountability really. But in the next 12 months, if we were gonna start doing something, the government, the t telecom folks, the large off takers, the, the SME, smallholder farmers, what, what do you think needs to be done rather urgently and can be done over the next 12 months? While I am first a crusader for blockchain solutions because of the collaborative nature it offers, I mm -hmm. believe we need to build and uh, institute collaboration across many sectors. You will find Robert is building a solution that would build doesn't compete with me. Governments should encourage collaboration, stop licensing every other day a similar uh, organization and try and get the players who are there to collaborate and share the data. If you pick Kenya, for example, the Minister of Agriculture a few years ago started digitizing farmers, creating a list of farmer registry. Safaricom is doing the same thing. We are doing the same thing. Every single person is doing the same thing. When will we create one source of data that enables all of us to stop going to register farmers and then move towards providing solution instead of uh, when Adam comes to Kenya, the first thing you must go and create uh, a, a database. They should be a common database. And that is why I am a believer that blockchain solution will create a faster, safer, collaborative framework. Um, but building capacity within government, institutions like uh, Bay Atlantic University, to try and build capacity so that some governments do not know they're cropping in the dark. Uh, and it's important to build capacity within government mm -hmm. and uh, collaboration with academia. It's, there is a lot of papers written and kept even right behind you. I can maybe find one or two that nobody has ever used. And uh, if we all used and collaborated around that, we would all be able to build a much bigger, faster economy. Of course, the other solutions like uh, uh, cheapening of uh, creation of cheaper smartphones, because then we stop, USSD is a very expensive solution. So by using smartphones, we'd be able to create a much cheaper solutions and uh, we make uh, data light applications that make it cheaper for the poor economy. Excellent idea. Ex excellent ideas. I think they all they all are doable. You really hit a nail on the head when when you said when I go to some place, I need to create a new database because almost every project I've been on in Africa has has had a component. In fact, I'm talking to a group right now about the very same thing in Nigeria, where I just returned from to build yet another database of, uh, of smallholder farmers. And this is a, a great segue. Uh, Kip, thank you. You know, your your commitment, your innovation to the global food security, as well as poverty relief is admirable and uh, keep going. I wanna follow this up and, and the blockchain, which is fairly new to me, um, is something that I'm very, very interested in. So let's go to uh, our, our software you. guru, uh, Robert Okin. Robert is the founder and CEO of Better World Systems, commonly known as Busis. Uh, Robert and his firm are based in Ghana. Uh, they focus on developing unique digital solutions and services related to the sustainable development goals. So that's an incredibly broad area. Uh, they've worked in 63 developing countries. And just let me plug this, Robert, please don't be offended. But uh, earlier this year, the United Nations uh, Global Compact named Robert as the 2021 SDG pioneer for digital innovation and inclusion. Uh, and just a week or two ago, he was selected as the Ghana ICT Industry CEO of the year. So welcome, Robert. Thank you very much, Adam, uh, uh, for your kind words and uh, greetings to everyone listening to us. All right, I see. Uh, I'd like to start as a software-based organization focusing on the SDGs. I'd like to start with a, a fairly simple question. What types of, of software applications do you feel have the best chance of helping governments, producers, off takers and others improve their efficiency and effectiveness? We all know change is difficult for many, especially when, when they've been doing the same thing for generations and learn from their parents and their grandparents. What, what platforms have the best chance of succeeding? 
Uh, you're on mute, Bobby. Uh, Robert, we may be having some technical difficulty. Can anyone hear me? Maybe yes, I'm we can one. hear you, Mr. Saffer, but I think they're having technical difficulties. I also can't see Roland. Right, Roland went offline. I will reach out to him. Yeah. I, don't I think he's there. online. He's online, but I think he's Wi-Fi. Yeah. Okay, Bobby, are you back? Yes, I'm back. Did you hear the question? No, I lost you on the question. The question was, as a software-based organization, what types of software applications do you think are going to have the most chance of success you know, in helping governments, producers, off-takers, et cetera, uh, transition into a more efficient and effective sector? Okay, thank you very much, Adam. Um, yes, I'll say um, digital tools can aid in every part of the agricultural value chain. And I'll take each value process that faces in it. So for planning, a farm management software helps farmers plan what, when, and how to plant and make business decisions. For inputs, a supplier information management software helps farmers identify, connect, and trade with suppliers of quality input. For on-site production, a farm management software helps farmers plan, monitor, and analyze all activities on the farm easily. In some cases, you have learning and information sharing software that enables extension service to reach farmers via mobile telephony to enhance even for storage and the keep us talk about the warehousing and monitoring and evaluation software helps monitor storage conditions to ensure best practices for harvest for post harvest processing a quality management software to support supply chain regulation such as product grading among regulators producers suppliers and consumers are valuable for transportation, which is a significant challenge in agriculture in Africa, logistics software provides farmers with information on transportation booking to ensure the timely delivery of their produce to off-takers. Finally, for access to market, an e-commerce software that provides farmers with information on market prices and a platform to sell their produce are also valuable. Uh, it is also important to mention that there are software that provides some of these systems as integrated solution or standalone solution within the value chain. However, this solution could be prioritized and even designed and deployed differently depending on several prevailing factors. Thank you, Adam. Yeah, you, you've, uh, you've addressed my, uh, where I was leading, you've addressed uh, you know, all of the points you make are really I appreciate you focused them on SDG 20 hunger. Um, and I understand that there are many applications that could be applied to throughout the value chain. So my question is, you know, is the in the countries you've worked in, is the government infrastructure, you know, digital infrastructure there, are the off takers, be they multinationals or 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 local or aggregators? You know, are they prepared, even if you gave them a solution, do they have the platform, do they have the knowledge, do, and do they have the, the interest and commitment to actually change and, and learn how to use this system? Is, is, that, is that sort of swimming upstream? Or is that, you know, you have the package, but you can't plug it in anywhere because they're not yet at a level where they can, can rise to, to use it efficiently? Yeah, so Adam, yeah. Um, I think the main obstacle preventing digitalization of Africa's agricultural sector include one funding, government commitment, partnership, and user-centered design. And I think the, the point you are making falls around user-centered design. I think African government must invest uh, in the research and development of evidence-based national digital agricultural strategies coupled with public investment plans. From our experience working with four out of the eight regional economic communities in Africa, we realized that government-funded digitalization for agricultural projects often do not fit into any broader developmental strategy. This ends up stalling the ability of beneficiaries to experience any significant 
long-term benefit of the digital system. This is because the sustainability of the digital solution is always dependent on network effects and how well these systems build a network and create value for all stakeholders as they leverage on the system. So government can be more intentional than reactive in developing self-sustaining digital solution with a national digitalization strategy. Uh, I think thankfully uh, we are assisting some governments in the Middle East through technical assistance to ensure a holistic strategy for digitalization for agriculture. We have observed projects that can be done with more advanced technology to create greater value being uh, restricted to a narrow project scope due to lack of fin financing. In some cases where we have the opportunity to dive deeper into why there is limited financing, we discovered that potential funding partners have no incentive. Therefore, stakeholders should build stronger partnership from the initial stages where problems are being defined and solutions are being conceptualized to ensure that we create compelling business cases to attract investors. We also see scenarios where solutions are developed and deployed, but do not live up to the expected outcomes because of a foreign solution was replicated or procured without consideration of the prevailing user challenges or characteristics right. that could influence the adoption of digital systems. Yeah, thank you, Adam. You're welcome. Thank you, Robert. You know, in all of my years in, in development, um, the biggest common denominator for me is behavioral change. In all my assignments, whether I'm in the field or I'm in a head office, I, I look at it as behavioral change because you've got to get people to think differently in agriculture, more commercially, longer term, digitally, et cetera, et cetera. So, so from Busis, you know, you've got a lot of projects under your belt. Could you share just one uh, that is relevant to this discussion that, that you know, whether it, it worked or it didn't, that's up to you to, to, to comment on. I get a lot of these take years to really determine whether they're going to have the impact you expect. But one good example of, of, a, of a SDG2 zero hunger application that, you, uh, that you've used. Okay, yeah, so um, I'll... Briefly, briefly though. Okay, so let me give an example. Uh, we, we have undertaken, an, we took a project for an organization that had the objective to use audits to inform the development of evidence-based programs with impact investors to ensure responsible production and sourcing of agricultural commodities and forest products. However, its field auditors relied on manual and paper-based checklists, documentation, reporting processes, which made the process cumbersome and resulted in inefficient data collection information loss in some scenarios. So what did we do at BUSES? We were contracted to design and develop a user-centered, and the keyword again, user-centered, field auditing mobile application to enable the field auditors to easily assess checklists, collect, analyze, and share data to address this challenge. Mm -hmm. Considering that the field auditors carried out audits in remote areas, the mobile application had offline and online functionalities to prevent information loss due to unavailability of data uh, access in remote areas, like what happened to this section when my internet went off. We ensure that the solution can work uh, in remote areas. So today, uh, we've been able to have an impact on, on that. The organization has leveraged that to, to get data and to build business cases, to mobilize funds from impact investors, one, enhance sustainable production value change in West Africa and Southeast Asia. So if you look at this scenario, uh, you see a challenge like information flow can either enable or hinder the development of program and financing, which are significant challenges that limit the effectiveness and efficiency of agricultural value chain in Africa. Thank you, Adam. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you, Robert. Um, I'm trying to watch the time here. I think I will move on and come back to you uh, a little later, but thank you, Robert. You are certainly, uh, developing some very unique solutions that you're the only company I've met that focuses completely on the SDGs and, are, and is versatile enough to work on social safety nets and, and uh, social protection and work from, from South Sudan to the South Pacific. So we look forward to abuses uh, setting the precedent in, in many, many ways. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Um,
I'd like to move on to, to, to Roland. Um, now, um, I can barely see you, Roland. I don't know if you can turn on a light. Um, it's, it's very, very dark, so I can't, I can't yes. really see you at all. Yes, Adam, I'm having a, we just had a power outage and that's uh -huh. why my internet was out for a bit. I'm actually sitting outside right now. You might hear some uh, background noise, but I'll do my best to be loud enough. I'm sorry, I have no other means to have any light around me. So if I no turn problem. on the generator and then we might not even hear each other. So um, yeah. let's just hope my voice can be good enough to light up uh, the entire webinar at the moment. <laughs> okay, well, you are coming across clear. Uh, to everybody, Roland is the CEO of Greenhouse Ventures in Cameroon. Uh, they focus on developing and deploying climate smart greenhouses across the country, um, but he's working on mobile apps uh, to support, uh, to aid diaspora in, in funding uh, and maybe not transferring just money, but transferring money to have a greenhouse put into the family plot. Uh, he's working on a, a trading platform. He's also an educator, believes in knowledge sharing in a big way. He's president of Funic University. Uh, it's a very interesting story. So welcome, Roland. Um, glad thank you. you thank you, Adam, for having me. You're welcome. Uh, let, let me start by asking you a general question, if you don't mind. In your, in your, in, in your, in your perspective, why is agro agricultural digitization Africa still still unattainable yet for I know Paulo mentioned it's relatively new but there's been years and years of investments made in this sector for databases for platforms for training and PESA and various fintech why is it still sort of crawling along at, at this late stage yes um, agriculture agriculture in Africa is still not regarded as a business, uh, like we were talking here earlier. And that is why some of these hardcore real solutions are not yet being implemented. And even if uh, there are institutions that are trying to implement them, they are not taken seriously. You know, agriculture in, in Cameroon, I will speak more specifically, is still being uh, carried out by the older population. This older population is very distant away from digitization and it makes it even very hard for them to be able to adopt these new technologies that can actually be used in agriculture today. The second aspect is that, you know, any investments that are kind of going into agriculture, they are not sustainable or real investments. They are more, of, more or less charitable investments. I mean, if you look around today, any investments that are going into agriculture usually would be going for cash crops, but not mm -hmm. uh, vegetable or food crops, something that 90% of the population is based on or farming on. So it makes in such a way that the real solutions um, uh, go to the population that is not so, uh, so savvy. And uh, those who actually need it the most uh, don't really get it, which is why, you know, despite the numerous investments that keep going into that sector, very little has been done. We, Africa today has a very large and fast growing youth population. And, but unfortunately this youth population is not involved in agriculture at all. And that right. makes it a very, very big problem. I believe that the key in digitizing Af agriculture in Africa has to start with how do we attract and retain the youths in agriculture? And uh, to get that done, it's one of the solutions that we are looking to bring into the game at the moment. No, I agree with you. Women and youth, I mean, they've got to get interested in agriculture and they certainly don't want to live the life their parents are living. Um, exactly. So, you know, how do you make it uh, easier, accessible, a little bit more sexy in terms of a, a career move? Um, tell us, tell us more, Roland. Tell us more about the greenhouses that you're designing, you're building, you're deploying. You know, how how can they in greenhouse farming be used as a model to emulate across Africa? You know, I, I know we talked before a little bit about vertical farming and the incredible demands on power in other aspects to make it. You know. A little bit challenging for Africa, but greenhouses, you know, seem to be a great idea. Um, how can greenhouse farming be instrumental in catalyzing the digitization of agriculture in Africa? Yes, uh, that's a very, very good question. Um, what we have been able to do here in Cameroon is some eight years ago, we started by introducing this uh, climate smart, low cost uh, greenhouses in the country. Uh, to give you a little history about that, Cameroon has never had a greenhouse. 
up until about 2006. And the first greenhouse costed about half a million dollars, which, you know, exactly didn't really make any sense. So we came in with a model of sustainable and affordable greenhouses, which became very, very attractive uh, to many. Secondly, uh, we've been able to design greenhouses that are adaptable to every ecological zone in Cameroon. Cameroon, for you know, it's one of those countries in Africa that, like you say, it's African miniature, but has seven ecological zones. So being able to design a greenhouse that is adapted to a particular zone, adapted for the cultivation of particular crops, is one of the things that we've been able to do. The third aspect is also being able to uh, standardize uh, the cultivation of a wide variety of crops which we've been able to do uh, to this moment. Using greenhouses to be able to move into digitization is, some, is our next, is our next uh, best goal because uh, we now see a way where we've been able to attract and retain youths and women in the domain of agriculture. And one of the things that we've been able to do is being able to bridge the gap between the farms and the markets. Because usually in Cameroon, for example, to be more specific, the farmer is not a marketer and the marketer is not a farmer. Uh, so agriculture is act actually left at the mercy of this middleman. And there are too many of them in there. Uh, they tend to determine the price. They tend to determine how the market works. They tend to determine whatever is to be produced. But what we've been able to do is not only design greenhouses, but also we are instituting kind of a market platform wherein anybody with a greenhouse actually has access to a market. And at prices that makes uh, the investment in the greenhouses actually actually very sustainable and a return on investment, which is very, very encouraging. Today, uh, we've been able to build over 400 greenhouses all around the country. And uh, we engage in several uh, participants or members throughout from universities to uh, community groups, to governments, to developmental organizations like the United Nations um, and many more. And we believe that um, the solutions that we are bringing in today will go a long way to be emulated, you know, not only in Cameroon, but we believe that is something that would go in many other parts of Africa. I agree. I love the idea. I really do. I think it's affordable. I think it can be scaled. It can be scaled down to, uh, to the smallholder farmer, let's say, in the family or a small community. But probably more, you're looking at uh, more commercial approaches, which, which I further support. You know, can you, we talked about this a little earlier, Roland, uh, before this conference. But I'd like to, you to explain to the audience, you know, you mentioned to me that a major part of of the greenhouse play deployment uh, in terms of digitalization is data analytics. And I'd like you to explain a bit more about, you know, what types of data are being collected? How's it being used? What is the Delta between, you know, pre-digitalization and post, you know, how does, how does the data, data analytics work and how is it applied? Yes, um, our key to success today is uh, data collection and how we analyze that data to be able to use in our cultivation uh, methods. Uh, one of the things we do before we even get to uh, set up a greenhouse, uh, we start by doing a whole feasibility study. Uh, mm -hmm. In that study, we, we take in uh, data from you know, humidity, temperature, uh, we take in attitude, uh, altitude, uh, we take in soil data, and uh, we're taking uh, rainfall in that particular environment, wind speed, sun direction, and all of that. All of this information helps us to be able to uh, better design a greenhouse, but also um, helps us to, uh, as to what we are looking to cultivate. With mm -hmm. that information, we are, able to, we are able to target markets that are closer and nearer to that particular greenhouse. And, and because of this data that we, we are collecting, um, it has given us an insight as to uh, what we can improve on. Um, and during an entire cultivation cycle, we collect a lot of data in terms of how many, you know, the sizes of the fruits, uh, how many fruits we can get for a plant and why, I mean, and we use that data to be able to analyze things as such as why didn't we do well in this particular area versus the other area. And all of this information better just helps us to be able to improve on the processes in different areas. Today in Cameroon, we've been able to set up greenhouses in, um, in six regions out of 10 regions. And I mean, we, we have been, I will tell you a little story. Uh, sometime in 2015, uh, one of our ministers of agriculture uh, challenged me to the fact that greenhouses could not work in the economic capital, which is in Douala. 
And uh, I gave him a bet. And he said, hey, Roland, the day you get greenhouses working in Douala, uh, I would make greenhouses, you know, a nationwide policy throughout the country. And that is something that we've been able to do because today in Douala, we have more greenhouses than any other part of Cameroon, which of course, Douala used to be a place where people believe that, you know, it is non-agricultural, nothing can be produced in these areas. But today we are proving that with the data we have been able to collect, with the designs that we've been able to put to play, we're able to produce a lot more than anyone ever expected. And actually we're converting barren land into very highly productive land. Such a phenomenon has attracted a lot of youths, a lot of individuals into the domain of agriculture and making people now see agriculture as a business and not just something as a means to an end. Because usually and previously, people have always looked at agriculture as the last thing they do when every other thing has failed. But we are reversing that train and making people see agriculture as the first and the best thing you can do uh, before every other thing starts failing. And it is becoming very interesting. Like you mentioned, we are making agriculture very, very sexy, very, very fancy, and very, very attractive. And all of this has to do with a lot of the data that we are collecting and how we analyze it and put it into use. Well, I think, I think great. I think uh, it makes sense. I think to me, again, change, behavioral change, the people you're working with, which obviously are adopting this change, have to uh, be ready and willing to uh, to look at the data, learn how to analyze it, make decisions by it, and, and and more importantly, change the way they've been making decisions in the past. And this is the this is the thing. And now, yeah, it seems like people are adopting this. You're rolling out a, a number. I don't know how many greenhouses you have, but it sounds like they're they're increasing rapidly. Um, I believe you had mentioned in a in a previous discussion with the, that you're thinking about or you have implemented a franchise model. Franchising is a, is an interesting uh, business model for a lot of people across the developing world, um, some better than others. And I would like, if, if you don't mind, if it's too early, let me know. Sure. But could you elaborate sure. a little bit about your franchising model, where it is today and where you expect it to go? Yes, um, when we started greenhouses, of course, it, it is, it is, uh, it is uh, an activity that requires some investment. And uh, in the beginning, I mean, everybody was very skeptical. Uh, one of it, they, they, they asked the question, why greenhouses in Cameroon? I mean, greenhouses are only meant for, you know, the Western world or, you know, uh, countries that have four different climates. Why do we need greenhouses in Cameroon? Cameroon has very good soils, uh, good climates. Why greenhouses? And over and over, we, we tried making people understand that the use of greenhouses is not only uh, about, uh, ab ab about, about the climate aspect, but also about the sustainability aspect. The fact that you, know, you can use very small lots of land for very huge production is very, very important. The fact that you, know, you can actually get the youths, the women, the young and very old into agriculture is very, very important. The fact that you can use greenhouses uh, to grow crops that are normally been imported in Cameroon is very, it's, it's, it's another very valuable aspect. The fact that you can use greenhouses to grow in very natural environments, it's, it's, it adds on to the value of this, of, of all of what we, we are looking to do. So yes, um, one of the ways that we, we use to be able to uh, uh, make greenhouses uh, something of, 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 of nationwide was introducing this franchise model. With the franchise model, what did we do? Uh, for example, you Adam, you would, you would bring in land and uh, we would set up the greenhouses we will manage together and then we will go on to split the profits. And that actually attracted a lot of people. And that also enabled us to be able to set up greenhouses in areas where, you know, they never existed or in areas where we never had access to. And today we have even people in the diaspora who are based in the United States, for example, and they can own a greenhouse in Cameroon. We have a, a greenhouse academy where we train uh, individuals in greenhouse and green and sustainable agriculture. So they go on to manage, you know, farms of our franchisees and partners. Uh, and the collective aspect is that we have a supermarket today, wherein everything that we have is from all our greenhouses have been sold at. So basically, the franchise model has enabled us to be able to increase our footprints around the entire country. Today, uh, we've built over 400 greenhouses uh, in six different regions all over the country. Um, we are attaining a production capacity of about uh, 800 kilograms uh, of produce every week, uh, something that as of last year, we only had about 200 kilograms. And, and as of next year, we should be getting to about uh, 
uh, we should be getting to about a million, um, a million um, by mid of next year. And we believe that at some point we should be able to have a, a huge, a huge impact in terms of you know local production. Today we've been able to reverse the trend of a lot of the produce that would normally been imported. Things like uh, colored bell peppers, things like uh, spinach, things like uh, strawberries, things like uh, broccoli, and all of these items, uh, food items that normally were imported, we are now growing them. And we've also been able to reduce the price on these items because they're now grown locally, making people now believe that, well, good food is not only to be consumed by the rich and wealthy, but each and everyone um, has a right to good food. I believe that good quality food is more of a human right than that which uh, is just belongs to those who belong to uh, the wealthy and the rich class. And because of this uh, franchise model that we have been able to introduce, we, we have, we've had so many people uh, interested in greenhouses uh, today, um, from farming groups who come together and, and contribute funds uh, to be able to invest in a greenhouse, because the guarantee is that we are working with you to manage uh, the greenhouses, and we also ensure that everything that has been harvested uh, would be sold. And not only that, not only that it has been sold, but everything that will be harvested is of good and very high quality. Um, today, I have been able to uh, invite, I work with a lot of experts from countries like Ghana, from countries like Kenya, who are here, and they train our own local Cameroonians because yes, Cameroon had, uh, prior to us, Cameroon had no school of greenhouses, uh, but today we have been able to train over 200 youth in the domain, and they're going on either to own their own farms or work with us or work with our partners. But thanks to the franchise model, uh, I believe that it has really been, it has been very instrumental in uh, replicating and multiplying our footprints uh, throughout the entire country. And it's something that we want to be able to share with many others around the continent so that greenhouses become uh, a way uh, for agriculture throughout the entire continent and not only Cameroon. Oh, I think it's terrific. I really think it's terrific. what what strikes me a little bit, Roland, about about the greenhouse model um, is, you know, this is not a case of out with the old and in with the new. We're not purging the entire system and, and replacing it. So I think, you know, technologies like artificial intelligence or remote sensing, robotics, data analytics, these are making the future very exciting. But I think the the fastest adoption rate will be to, to those companies that can blend the old with the new and not make it completely new. Um, I think that uh, Kip is doing that. I think that Robert is doing that. You know, you, you have to bring people along. Like as Paulo started, you don't have to start with a, uh, what's a good example? You don't have to start with a, a PC that's a 24 gig or 24, 48 or 126 or 128, 520. You know, you can jump right into to gigabytes and terabytes and things like that. You don't have to take as long, but you can't just throw out what you've done. You know, you have to tie it to the foundation that's been there. And I think that makes the transition easier. Anyway, thank you, Roland. We're, 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 we're running out of time. I wanted to speak with you more, all of you more, but I think we're, we're getting toward the, the Q&A session. I've had a lot of Q&A coming in the window here. And so I would like to, uh, to move along and um, pick a couple of questions. I'd like to open the floor and because of the time frame, I may assign questions to, to certain people and then we'll go for everybody. Um, the first question um, is, is which digitalization systems are needed or tools will be required to support, monitor and enforce policies within the African Continental Free Trade Agreement you know, the FCTA, CFTA, this agreement, uh, among other things, guarantees free movement of goods and services produced on the continent. It's a very significant agreement. Um, I'd like to ask Robert to uh, to give us his view on, on the software and the other implications of this agreement. Will, do you think Africa be able will be able to take full advantage of this agreement? Okay, Adam, uh, thank you very much. Um, this is a great question. And um, I think in the case of AFC, FTA, uh, creating policies that encourage and enable the development of mutually beneficial partnership for trade is critical. Uh, from our experience, we realize um, countries have policies. Uh, what is lacking is harmonization of those policies at the continental level. 
And if that is done, uh, it will help with integration of the various systems that these countries have. Uh, in terms of maturity, some of the countries have systems that help them to do something. Uh, others do not have. And uh, there need to be a kind of harmonization that will help bring all of them at the same level, if possible, so that they will be able to, to trade um, digitally. Uh, one other thing that is critically needed will be a digital marketplace uh, to be able to sell. Uh, currency uh, payments is also a big issue. Mm -hmm. uh, we always say uh, it's quite cheaper importing items from China as compared to uh, doing business uh, with a, a, a farmer in Ghana and a, 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 a off taker in Kenya. These are some of the challenges that we have on the continent. So at the continental level, if we are able to have policies that bridge this gap that we have, we'll be able to build on technologies that will seamlessly help us do business uh, seamlessly. I, I hope so. I hope so, Robert, because, you know, you, like, like a lot of things in, in, in the U.S., and uh, across Africa and other places, the, the big players dominate and the little players are never heard from again. You know, you look at your average chamber of commerce or business associations, the three or four or five big firms. I'm hoping it won't be the three or four or five big countries that get the benefit. And in that line is this another question um, similar. You know, when you look at digitization, the large companies are certainly taking advantage of the latest technologies. Um, but what about the smallholder farmer? You know, most digital solutions uh, are not reaching the poor, rural, small scale farmers and their value chain actors at that level, especially women who are the most uh, disadvantaged. So digital solutions in the agricultural sector, the solutions are outpacing the readiness to adopt those solutions across most of the uh, smallholder farmer community where most of the produce comes from, you know? It's African agriculture is predominantly smallholder driven. And so how can how can the average smallholder farmer or SME service provider along the value chain get access to such tools and techniques? I'd like to direct that question uh, to Kip. Welcome back. Uh, one of the biggest lessons we learned is the adoption of MPSA in Africa, especially in Kenya. The understanding of the customer journey and mapping through. When we started this journey in Mamlaka, uh, when we went looking for investors, the first time you say, I'm building a uh, digital solution, somebody says, oh, I have built one. I have one in the shelf. And there are many people who have built solutions who they have not thought through. For example, when we, when we want to order uh, produce from a small scale, Africa is dotted with small scale farmers and small scale traders. The small scale trader takes a quarter of a sack of potatoes. A farmer cannot transport from uh, the rural Kenya or half a sack of potatoes all the way to Nairobi to one customer. The cost doesn't make sense. So at times, some of the technologies that we have are, shelf, are, are, are picked off the shelf as opposed to those which are developed. And those which will be developed, especially through collaboration, because there are many niche solutions. There are people who work with inputs in a specific field. There are people who have digitized certain value chains. Uh, collaboration, and that's why uh, I have, without shame, believe that even for Africa, um, the blockchain will enable us to reduce the frictions that we have, be it uh, infrastructural, be it this, because then we build on top of what somebody else has built. Well, the small, okay, but I'm really interested. Okay, okay. Um, we can come back to that. I mean, the, the, the point I'm sort of so driving- For the smallholder farmers, yeah. because of, because of non-scoping, because of poor scoping, MPESA succeeded because we understood how money is transferred from one micro person to the other. Okay. This is the key lesson that needs to be applied to all the others. How does the micro farmer work? And how does this solution, how do we, the job is on Robert, myself, yourself and others mm -hmm. to then make, demystify this solution to make it easy for them to use it. Uh, otherwise, if we make it off the shelf, it becomes very difficult 
because you don't understand. Uh, I always believe that in the in the tech development, there is a big role for uh, sociologists and psychologists who understand how uh, these people behave, what is their day to day, and without involving those people, then tech is prepare tech solutions which are very technical and cannot be adopted by the small user. Absolutely, absolutely. I've just lost my screen. Another technology problem here. We, we can see you and hear you. Not just Africa loses power, but that's classic. <laughs> classic example of trying to do business in Africa. Really, I mean, this is not an unusual situation. Thank, thank you, Kip. Let me let me direct one to Roland. Um, it's it's sort of along the same lines, you know. I don't know if this is too much of a stretch, but private sector technology innovators, you know, again, they, they're delivering to other large players. It's very difficult for them to profitably deliver at the smallholder level. Um, and in one, in a, in, a, in a perverse sense, the fact that some of the new technologies are, are going to the larger players and not the small players poses a risk that the digital divide will become even worse as the new players adopt the technology and the small players don't. You know, it's a risk of widening that digital gender divide too, because because women are at the at the face the most challenges. Um, so how can we get these private sector driven innovations uh, shared more equitably? And you know, we not we not we have to pay attention to the smallholder voice. The, the women and youth voice, the vulnerable populations that are involved along the value chain. So, you know, you've got China buying into Africa, you got all these countries buying up land and gonna do wonderful things with it, but how do we get, be sure that we get this down to the smallholder level and uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, the enabling environment is, is not only conducive, but inclusive. Uh, do you have any views on that, Roland? Yes, Adam. Uh, I think these are one of the principal uh, aspects that I'm actually working on because when we started, we, 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 we understood that problem. You see, uh, and I'll talk for a classical case like Cameroon. Uh, Cameroon's population is largely agricultural, but mm -hmm. the, those who involved in, in, in the agricultural activities, uh, mostly you know, from the villages, in most cases, sometimes illiterate, uh, and in most other cases, their economic situations are so are so uh, hard that you know they cannot even get to the basic threshold to be able to access some of these uh, interventions that institutions can actually uh, introduce to them. So it's 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 a it's a huge problem. Um, in many ways, you know, the government have tried to create some sort of cooperatives wherein these farmers could could come under and then for them to be able to gain access to some of these resources. But again, that was still a big problem because. Uh, most of these farmers have no access to the information that is actually out there. They realize that at some point, you know, most of the cooperatives were not even made of farmers, were just made of people who wanted to just formalize themselves, to be able to gain access to some of these resources that were out there. I think that the, the, the solution to be able to onboard uh, small scale holders has to start with working with, with the private sector, not, uh, not really with the government sector. And I'll say this with, with, with all confidence because, um, the government has been in the business of trying to engage smallholder farmers forever. Uh, there are all sorts of funding that has come through uh, for that to happen. But even to today, it is still very tricky uh, to the point where these smallholder farmers have actually lost hope, uh, they lost the trust and don't believe in those interventions anymore. Uh, many others who come to the smallholder farmers to, with the point that, oh, we're coming to help, we're coming to assist, they are more or less coming to uh, to take advantage of their uh, their poverty status and these images, uh, so that they can go on and get more funding and financing. I mean, the saddest thing is the fact that if you go now to these smallholder farmers and try to tell them that hey, you belong to this organization and you're trying to work with them to get access to this information, they just believe that well, everybody just comes, takes you know their data, collects, takes photos, and go collect some money, which they never get back in return. So. Uh, we need to get to the point where we, we, we start to identify, you know, the real actors and find ways that we can work with one person at a time or one small scale holder at a time. And uh, you cannot do that, especially if you need large uh, investments uh, to be able to carry on with. 
which is why we believe that with what we're doing with greenhouses, it's very, very instrumental because uh, once you get one greenhouse in a particular family, you get that entire family working with that particular greenhouse. The idea is that, well, they, everything they, they cultivate, everything that they harvest, uh, we buy everything or provide a market for that, enables them to get more money to be able to set up all the greenhouses and that chain can actually spiral out. Uh, and that's the best way that uh, we believe that that solution could be tackled. And unless we begin to find ways that we regain their confidence and regain their trust, we will never get anywhere close to being able to understand the real problem. Many a times we believe that we know, we know the problem, but what we believe as what we know, especially the educated, the educative uh, problem is not really what the real problem is. Um, getting on the ground, talking to them, understanding them, but making them understand that you have the real solutions for the real problems is what we really need to start doing. Here at Greenhouse Ventures, uh, we, we did not only come in with, with, with greenhouses, we also came in with the aspect of training. Uh, we came in with the aspect of the market and we do not only train them in cultivation, we also train them how to sell. You can either sell to us or you can sell to anyone where you do have a market. And we made it in such a way that uh, we are able to develop or create markets around particular farms. So if we have a farm in a location, say in Yaoundé, uh, and we have a good cluster of farms, what we do is that we create markets around those particular farms. And it makes them actually see where their produce is going and actually see the money from their produce. Many a times the smallholder farmers don't see where the money is coming from. You know, uh, uh, they produce today, they sell tomorrow, but they have no idea about how much it was being sold. So to a point where they are never able to uh, to uh, to they are never able to standardize their cultivation and never able to valorize it. So for us, it's being able to uh, engage you know these smallholder farmers in the entire value chain of their produce, making them understand that okay, the cost of production is this, the the, you know, the, the value of the sale is this, and this is what they're making, and that's what we at mm -hmm. Greenhouse Ventures we've been able to do because not only do we have greenhouses, but we also have a market platform where we engage all of them on and they actually see uh, the value of their production. And when there are any changes in terms of what to produce, the value, the quality, they are all informed. And uh, today we are happy that we've gotten many, many people involved in a technology that people believe that it was, you know, quote unquote, the white man's technology. They are now believing themselves with that and they are making a lot of gains, which we believe that uh, down the road, we could, be, we could be able to engage many more people and see how the technology could be valorized to many other nations uh, okay. entirely. I hope so, Roland. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, unfortunately, we're we're running out of time. We have run out of time, and in you know one hour to speak to three highly esteemed and successful uh, practitioners and cover African agriculture is just not enough. But I really hope that after today, those listening have a clearer picture of what it means, of what an inclusive, digitally enabled agricultural transformation, how it could help Africa, how it could help not only uh, the big players, but the smallholder players and the service providers along the value chain. You know, there's a couple of big issues we did not go into today. Obviously, um, we did not talk really much about access to finance. And while M-Pesa is a great thing, you know, in my experience, uh, access to finance, be it government intervention funds or anything like that, um, it, it doesn't work as planned, let's say. And the institutions that are managing this, these funds clearly uh, are not oriented to the higher risk smallholder farmer. Um, there's a lot of pressure. So we did not talk about the C word. Um, the C word is, uh, C stands for corruption. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, of that going around the world today. That's not specific to Africa by any means, uh, but there needs to be these such, such, such technologies like blockchain where you can hopefully uh, have a transparent yet secure platform for exchanging information and goods and money. Um, there's a lot of things and hopefully the next, uh, that we will carry on from this if there's interest and our next webinar will carry on with another aspect of, of sustainable agriculture in Africa. It's the largest employment sector across the continent by far. It affects all, every family to some extent or the other. And I just uh, apologize that I can't address the questions that are still coming in at this late time. Uh, I really need to close. I would like to 
expressly thank uh, our speakers primarily who donated their time and, and prepared for this, this meeting. Uh, they are all gonna be uh, players to watch, uh, whether it's Malacca Foods, whether it's Greenhouse Ventures in Cameroon, Malacca Foods in Kenya and Busis based in Ghana covering, uh, covering global SAS, SAAS applications and uh, services. Thank you very much. I would like to also thank the uh, Global Policy Institute, in particular, the president, Paolo Vanchira, who is not only a good friend, but uh, has really pushed the Institute into moving into these directions that are so meaningful to us. And uh, Denise, Denise, is, uh, Denise Caritas, who is the uh, executive director who put this all together. And I know without her, I wouldn't be here because I kept losing everything and kept misplacing people's emails and what have you. And she's always been there for us. So thank you, Denise. Look forward to working with you again. Um, and lastly, the participants, you know, uh, your interest and commitment to one of the most urgent uh, and enormous challenges of our day, food and nutritional security, incomes, rural livelihoods. Uh, you know, please do stay tuned for future webinars coming from the Global Policy Institute and Bay, Bay Atlantic University. Uh, a very incredible, fairly new university that is becoming quite a powerhouse in Washington, D.C. If you're interested in, in that space or have uh, yourself or friends looking for uh, both undergraduate and graduate education that's affordable and applicable, I, I urge you to look up uh, Bay Atlantic University. So again, thank you all for coming and I wish you the, a great week and a wonderful, happy and healthy holiday season. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks, Kip. Robert. Thank Robert. you very much. Thank you. Um, Thank Denise, you Adam. I think the recording has ended. There's many good points and, and other questions that have come in. I just couldn't get to them, but uh, I'm sure we'll, we will all be talking again very soon. So take care. And again, thanks. We'll be in touch. Thank hey, you Kip. very much. Thank, Thank, you, Thank you, everybody. One more yeah. thing. Hey, Kip, um, can, I, uh, can I get contacts of Kip and Robert? Just like to stay in touch with you guys. Love what you guys are doing. I'll, I'll Thank send you very email. much. We will share that. I'll send an email with everybody's uh, email on it. And 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 for Alrighty. those and for those, if you want to look at this session again, this was recorded. So if you have people that say sorry, I missed it, I couldn't make it, they can go onto the Global Policy Institute uh, website and and watch a recording if interested. Okay. If you yeah. find this, you can forward to all Thank of us you. an email. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank you very much, Adam. Yeah. All right. Take yeah. care. Thank you, guys.